many of us, our first glimpse of the sound of a harpsichord comes from the songs we hear on the radio. Its most recent and surprising incarnation has been in hip hop. But going back, it seems each generation has had their own harpsichord moment, whether it's the Stranglers in the 80s, Golden brown, texture like sun. the Baroque pop era of the 60s, or its first uses in jazz in the 1940s. As a composer, I've always been tempted to write for the instrument, and in the last couple of years, I finally had the opportunity to write two pieces that involve major parts for the harpsichord. There was the piece I featured on my first premiere vlog, which I'll link to here, which featured an entire ensemble of plucked instruments. And yes, the harpsichord is plucked, I'll get onto that in a moment. And then there was the opera I wrote for Glyndebourne called Nothing. I have to admit that I wrote both of these without studying too much of the history or the background of the instrument, but it definitely made me feel more personally invested in it, and I started looking into it. And the more I did so, the more I felt really sorry for this instrument, which has kind of been a victim of history in two completely separate ways. The first was, of course, the rise of the piano. The harpsichord has a unique colour which is produced by a small plectrum which plucks the strings as the key is depressed. The sound is relatively gentle, but also includes a hint of click and buzz, both as the plectrum attacks the string, but also a small but perceptible attack as the string is stopped. Contrary to popular belief, there is a slight dynamic range to the sound, particularly on lower notes. One recent study suggested a range of up to 5 decibels was possible. There are also sometimes different stops which add strings in unison like a 12-string guitar or at the octave, which can be used to change the dynamic, as well as the various tricks harpsichordists use to trick the ear into hearing more dynamic range, for example by rolling a chord to give it more emphasis. Nevertheless, the limited dynamic range was definitely a drawback of the instrument, and with the arrival of the pianoforte with its louder and more rounded sound, the ability to greatly vary the volume of each note simply by varying the strength with which to press down the key was definitely a huge selling point. So where composers like Mozart and Haydn began their careers writing for the harpsichord, by the end they were writing entirely for the piano. And with that sense of things being in a state of constant progress and improvement, the harpsichord was seen as one of history's failures. The peak of its misery was perhaps during the cold winters of the early 19th century, where old, long-forgotten harpsichords stored in the Paris Conservatory were burned as firewood. And it became something that everyone just took for granted, that those old masterpieces, like much of Bach's output, for example, which were originally written for harpsichord, would just sound much better on the piano. It wasn't until the 20th century that things started to change. Leading the way to the revival of the instrument was Polish virtuoso Wanda Landowska, who commissioned a specially modified instrument from the piano manufacturer Pleil. She began by playing that great Baroque repertoire that exists for the instrument, but she also saw the need for bringing the instrument into the modern age by commissioning new works. Of these, probably the most important early works were Manuel de Falla's Harpsichord Concerto of 1926. and Francis Poulenc's Concert Champêtre from the following year. By the 1960s, composers started to explore much more radical sides to the instrument. Elliot Carter's double concerto for piano and harpsichord in 1961 is a huge and complex work. Ligeti wrote three fantastically original works for the instrument, each exploring a different aspect of the harpsichord's character. And Zanarkis wrote four pieces for the instrument, the most notable of which is Koai, which took advantage of the pedal system Pleil had introduced on their instrument. And there we can see the first hint of the second historical misfortune that was about to befall the instrument. In the 70s and 80s, there was a new movement amongst musicians to attempt to get closer to the actual sounds that composers would have written. So where you'd have a piece like Stokowski's arrangement of Bach's Passacalli and Fugue, which would have unashamedly grand and romantic style with huge bombastic orchestrations, 
Now the pendulum swung back to something that was attempting to get closer to the original ideas of the composer. And of course that involved getting closer to the original instruments. Modern violins were traded for Baroque instruments with gut strings, and instrument manufacturers, including harpsichord makers, tried to build instruments using the original designs and materials. And this approach took over and is now pretty much the default in most classical concerts today. Which of course is great in its way, but for the harpsichord it was that second historical tragedy, because now much of that recently commissioned new repertoire for the instrument, which was written for one of those modern playl style harpsichords, simply wouldn't work on the more traditional designs. The range was too wide, they used the pedals, or they took advantage of the rather mechanical sound of the modern instrument. Here's my friend Tamar Halperin, who played the harpsichord in the piece of mine that I mentioned earlier. While the Baroque harpsichord had a frame that was made of thin wood, strings that were made of gut, plectrums that were often made of feather or leather, the modern harpsichord was constructed with a metal frame with plastic plectrums with strings of steel. It was altogether a stronger instrument that was more robust, easier to maintain, rarely getting out of tune, unlike the Baroque instrument and altogether sounding like a machine that was very impersonal. The Baroque harpsichord has a very expressive tone, and as a performer, it's relatively easy and definitely very interesting to work with the sound. The modern harpsichord is um, sometimes not so expressive. The sound of the modern harpsichord actually fit very well with the aesthetic of the second part of the 20th century and the fact that the instrument sounded kind of like an impersonal machine actually fit very well with their aesthetics. <laughs> So the most positive spin you could put on the situation is that there are now two completely distinct instruments. Those modern instruments, solid and a little soulless, for which much of the modern repertoire was written, and the gentler, more traditional instruments, which play mainly the old repertoire. The reality is that it's now the turn of the modern instruments to face the prospect of being consigned to the scrap heap of history, and along with them many of those new pieces written in the middle of the 20th century. So is there any way out of this historical conundrum? The problem has been compounded by the fact that many early music specialists have not been interested in commissioning new works for the traditional instrument. But some of the leading stars of the new generation, including Tamar herself, are seeking to change that. Mahan Esfahani is another excellent player who regularly commissions and includes new pieces on his programmes. It would also be nice to imagine that the time might potentially be right for instrument makers to find new solutions, perhaps even some way of combining the best of both of these instruments. There's no doubt that there is experimentation going on. Esfahani himself recently performed on a newly created instrument that one review said was clearly designed to create an authentic sound whilst possessing the flexibility to project in larger venues. The same manufacturer also produced this fascinating new instrument called the Omniwork which mixes the harpsichord's pluck technique with a bowing effect invented by Leonardo da Vinci. My personal dream would be for manufacturers to find a way to make an instrument which kept the traditional tone, but like the piano had a greater dynamic range. I'm still not entirely clear why this isn't possible. For example, if the plectrum started resting directly on the string, wouldn't that allow you to use the same variation of force you can get from, say, plucking a guitar string? Anyway, I'll leave you with that thought, and just to say that the next time you hear a harpsichord, whether it's in a concert or in a song on the radio, spare a thought for the trials and tribulations that this fantastic instrument has been going through over the years. And let's hope it finds a way to fight itself out of its historical pickle. Thanks very much for watching. If you'd like to support the channel, do consider joining my patrons over at patreon.com. If you enjoyed the video, do please like, subscribe and share with your friends, and I'll see you next time.